This project, which is called Common Ground, is a super simple, symbolic um, act of celebrating the diversity of the country, the people, and the land uh, of the country, sort of prior to the current state of divisiveness, the current state of uh, amplified statehood, um, and going, going back to a time when this is sort of what the map would have looked like, where it was trees and this earth, the soil or the clay and the water. So um, essentially what I've done is spent the last 14 months collecting clay, wood ash and water from each of the 52 or the 50 states and six US territories. So 56 states and territories. Um, and the idea is to combine all of the materials into a single unified material. So to sort of erase the statehood, erase these lines uh, and, and go back and celebrate this state of the country. I mean, it's a simple, it's a simple idea. It's a little bit of a naive idea, but um, it's also sort of a, I hope, um, interesting and powerful idea. So the idea, so common ground, you know, there's, there's two parts to this project. I'm, I've, I've collected all these materials, I'm making a single material, and then the idea is to make work from those materials. And there's two pieces to the project. One is to make a series of 56 pots, sort of ceremonial pots, which I'll show you. And one is to make 56 plates, cups, and bowls, and then use those to have meals around the country where 56 people who wouldn't ordinarily have a seat at the same table will have a seat at the same table and, um, and hopefully uh, will facilitate some finding of common ground. So hence the name, hence the sort of double entendre about the ground that it's coming from and um, just a couple of definitions there. So here are 56 clays sort of laid out alphabetically, symbolically with the um, territories mixed in with the states uh, equally. Um, and I had, it, as I said, it took me about 14 or 15 months to collect them all. So I had this opportunity to take this one picture of them all together before starting to mix them, which was just last week, starting to combine them. Um, Here's just a close up where you can see really how incredibly beautiful they are as individuals and um, I'm hoping will be even more so as a collective. So here is the beginning of mixing some of them in large buckets just to see the kind of amplified uh, diversity of them in, in their adjacencies. <laughs> And this is the beginning of what it's starting to look like as a single clay, which will then be mixed with the ash and the water. And of course, once it's fired in a kiln, it will not look this color. There's really no way to know what the color, ultimate color will be, but um, that's kind of beside the point or that sort of is the point is that when you mix everything together, uh, you don't know what you're gonna get. This is the ash, some of the ash being mixed, which is more subtle than the clays, but also incredibly beautiful um, and diverse and interesting. And just as a side note, I, I tasted, I took a little taste of every one of these clays and ashes. Um, and it's, you can taste, you can smell the differences, you can taste and smell the similarities. It's, it's, it's quite literal. It's really a very literal project. So these are, this is a quick study, a couple of pages of sketches to show the evolution of the form that, be, that became the pots, the ceremonial pots sort of starting on the upper left with a sphere or an egg as kind of universal forms, um, you know, cross-cultural forms, forms found throughout nature. And then moving, then having a kind of simple thought of like, well, maybe these things should be open rather than closed as a gesture of being open to uh, communication, information, education, um, other ways of thinking, et cetera. Um, and then, having it stand on a strong foot um, so that it's, you know, stable, having these handles that sort of reference ears, which is again, very literal and not subtle. So, so the pots became the, here's 56 of them, these kind of battered, 
yet strong, standing, open, um, you know, pots representing whatever you want them to represent. They have many cultural references throughout history and across continents and cultures. Um, you know, they also in a way represent the country for me, the people, different societies, et cetera. Um, so then the materials that I've collected, so this clay body is from about four or five different states mixed together. And then the materials, the 56 will be turned into a glaze as well as some of the ash will be blown into the kiln to create an environment, um, uh, which will have an effect on the pots and also sort of become part of the DNA of the pieces. Here's a quick set of sketches of just trying to figure out what should the plate cup and bowl look like? Should they be um, tall and slender? Should they be short and squat? Should, you know, ultimately it came to a very simple form that um, would be stable, that could travel around the country, that could take a beating, that could hold a soup or a stew or cereal or tea or wine or nectar or whatever. So um, hang on, I'm gonna go back one second, Scott. So, so with where I got to with the project was once I started envisioning the idea of these meals around the country, you know, my first thought was, well, I'll, I'll have one in every state. And then I realized, well, that's sort of a silly idea because the whole point of the project is to erase the divisions of statehood and to celebrate the country as a whole. The other thing that I realized was that this is a much bigger project in terms of the meals and the notion of food and food ways and bringing people together around food and all of the uh, important symbolic and literal um, beauty and baggage that comes with making a meal for 56 people who don't ordinarily eat together practically and symbolically. Um, you know, who, who would make it, what food would be served, would it, from what origins would it derive, et cetera. So I started looking more into the world of food ways um, as, a, as a discipline and um, found Scott Barton, who is, um, is an expert in, in this world and a professor in this world and a, and a former chef. So we have, we have a mutual friend who connected us and I, I approached Scott about helping partic well, participating in the project and specifically helping by curating the, the meals portion of the project, which he agreed to do. And we met last summer, probably in June. So we've been working together now for six or seven months um, and it's been a fantastic, uh, for me, it's been an unbelievable education and experience. And I'm incredibly grateful that, that Scott's participating in the project and that he's here today with us. So what's gonna happen now is we're, we're gonna just discuss the project um, now that you have a brief intro. So here's something that Scott wrote and I'll introduce Scott Barton and he can take it from here. Scott, are you with us? Greeting. Good afternoon. Thank you to Ragna and Bar Barbara and everyone involved in producing this it really impassioned and, and uh, vibrant day. I've learned a lot. I've been here for all the day and I'm really grateful. I want to acknowledge that I'm on Lenny Lenape land here in Harlem in New York. And as you heard, Adam is in the West Coast and I'm in the East. And together we're trying to figure this out in the best way possible with the knowledge and skills and tools that we have. This is a very big project, very daunting and exhilarating at the same time. And it raises, as you will hear, a plethora of questions. And some of which <clears throat> we cannot answer. They need to be answered by engagement, by being in community and in communion with other people, which is uh, a large part of this statement that he has presented that I had uh, discussed with him in one of our calls. Um, to think about food and breaking down boundaries, to think about ways and to build off what Leah Peniman and Naima Peniman and the people at Soul Fire spoke about, of looking at the root of, of breaking down hierarchies, of finding ways to come together that will, we can't erase difference, but acknowledge the difference and embrace it. Uh, for me, it means that it needs to evolve in each location that it can occur in. 
that needs to work towards people's strengths and not impose a dictum. It needs to think about what they can bring together both as individuals, but then potentially the new community. It could be a meal that has indigenous people and uh, immigrants from a variety of countries, people who are landed here for generations that come like me, a descendant of Caribbean and Southern background and how we look at our foods and share them, both foods that come with us as we think of the transfer of foods, like so far discussed the things like okra and watermelon and uh, true yams and <clears throat> the native foods like turkey and chili peppers and corn and wild rice and how we can bring those together. How can we create a template whereby maybe one of the courses is green and that could be seaweed for someone on the coast. It could be collard greens in the deep south that's cooked. It could be uh, wild harvested lettuces or cultivated lettuces and herbs. Uh, it could be banana leaf and something wrapped inside, but it would give each community that agrees to participate in hosting a meal and bringing together disparate people to come not only in the kitchen to uh, cook, but also at the table, a way to see how their foods, their region can be represented and be shared with an, another set of people they may or may not know. That's the way I'm thinking about this. I'm very grateful to Adam because he makes me think a lot. I think, um, you know, we think about social science when we make a vessel, we show a certain amount of cult acculturation and knowledge. And so there's a tacit knowledge and understanding that, yes, we can cook on a flat stone. Yes, we can put food into the fire. But when we make a vessel, it changes the way we can experience the food and the things we can do with it. So to that, that's the kind of um, repartee for me that is very uh, dynamic in this, as well as a colleague of Adams in the West Coast, Bobby Tigerman, who's been very helpful from an art historical and a material cultural aspect about making and the history of making and bringing people together. But it takes many people both in regions that I do and don't know, who know local communities, who know local food ways that I may not be aware of, who know sites of memory and sites of trauma. Uh, I can inquire to some of my friends and colleagues and professional associates who fit certain uh, markers, if you will, based on their cultural heritage, ethnic identity, sexual orientation, uh, gender, et cetera. Um, but I think it, this idea that is about mapping, which we've begun by mapping, what, how do we look or relook or renew a way to look at this nation and its territories? And where are the questions that need to come up about who needs to be considered and included? These maps always already are incomplete. These maps begin a dialogue and <clears throat> I would hope in every single venue, someone raises a hand and says, what about this? Do you know about these people? Do you know about this faith practice? Do you know about this way of working the land? Do you know about these memorials that aren't recorded in the history books that should be? This morning, really briefly, and I'll turn it back to Adam, I was listening to the news as I, a news junkie and they were talking about the, um, the Historic Preservation Society here in New York. And there's a fight I didn't know about in Washington Heights, north of me, for what would be the second uh, potential house for the Underground Railroad in New York City, in Manhattan. Uh, and it's probably going to be destroyed to make a high rise building because there are some stipulations it doesn't fall in. And it, it is something precisely to me about this project a history that most of us don't know, a building I've walked by when I'm uptown, I've looked at it, it's, it's, a, it's unique and anomalous, but because of time, it has evolved. Its facade doesn't look like it did in the 19th century. And for that reason, it made to be destroyed. So we'd lose history before we even know that we can claim it. And for me, this is the kind of thing that we've heard throughout the day about how to see and open our eyes and be active listeners and 
actively engage together to create another way of looking and being together in this really divisive moment that we're trying to work our way through. I'll stop there and turn it back to Adam. Well, we don't have to turn it back. We'll just go back and forth. But I think that um, what, what Scott is also getting at in a very um, concrete way is this brings up the question of where would we have meals and why? And you, you can imagine a thousand different answers to that um, based on who you ask. Um, so one of the things that we've tried to do is think of many different ways of looking at the land mass that we call the US and mapping it and thinking of all the different kinds of maps that we could find and overlaying them and seeing if we can find points of convergence, uh, places that have deep symbolic meaning for more than one or two or three reasons, places that, that have different points that um, are touching it for one, one of these reasons or another. And, and then make a new map, make our own map of where we'd like to have meals to acknowledge um, and celebrate those places for those different reasons. So, you know, um, I mean, we, we've, we've been talking about this for months and it is in, in a way a little bit of a daunting question. I mean, we could almost as easily just throw some dice on the map and, and have, uh, or drop chopsticks and have meals where they land and they could be as important or as symbolic. It, it's only a way of us trying to get a handle on um, answering the question for ourselves really. And as Scott said, we'll get it wrong, of course, um, and there will be problems with every decision we make. And that's, that just goes without saying, but we have to, we have to make some decisions about, you know, practical decisions about where the meals will be and feel good about why we chose those places. And these are some of the reasons that some of the maps that we are considering and the, the list will go on and on. Um, so, and then as Scott also said, you know, this, this is a moment we're, we're sharing this project with you in, you know, mid flight. It's, it's 15 months old. I don't know how long it's going to be. It could be another year, it could be another decade. Um, these meals could go on and on. The, the idea of the pots, the, the, first, the first body of work that I showed, the, the ceremonial pots is that they will be completed and exhibited and they may be exhibited sometimes with meals or independently. And then, and then at a certain point in the near future, they'll be redistributed back one to each of the 56 states and territories where, where it will live permanently. The idea being that it's a single piece, it's a single sculpture or gesture that has 56 components and it, each one of those components will live in one of the states or territories. So it's a shared, it's a shared sculpture um, and it will live on that way. It could be in a public library or a museum or a school or whatever, just someplace where it can be on display with an explanation and, and you know, viewable by the public. So that the conversation that hopefully this project will initiate um, can be transmitted in as many ways as possible. One, through those pots, through these meals, through some sort of documentation. So my point in saying that this project is mid-flight is that we still have a million questions. And, you know, here is a list of some of the many, many questions that we um, discuss every time, you know, we start talking about it. Who will be at the table? Um, how, you know, a very important one is how will these conversations at the tables be initiated, directed, recorded? How do we have, how do we have, how do we address the really tough issues that we're talking about head on at a dinner table and not have it be just, you know, wow, that was a delicious meal. I've never eaten anything like that in my life. Thank you. Good night. And, you know, you go home to your corner. So how do we have those conversations um, so that they are meaningful and deep and, you know, and, you know, we don't have a rumble, we're not hosting rumbles all over the country. So, um, so those, those questions, you know, and then some really fundamental things like, should they be outside? Should we be sitting with our feet on the ground or is it okay to be inside? Should they be cooked on open flame or, or can we use a, you know, a commercial range? Um, the design of the table or tables, how do we make sure that you don't just sit and talk to the person next to you the whole time and then leave? How do we move people around? Um, you know, all sorts of things, utensils, dietary restrictions, will there be alcohol? 
Um, how are we going to get these things to travel from place to place, from meal to meal? We, we, ha we have had conversations about all of these topics. Um, and there are more topics, you know, the closer we get to having the first meal, more, more of these sort of practical issues will arise, no question. Um, so with that um, being said, I'm gonna, on this slide, I'm showing that we have a website for the project specifically. In, on that website, there's a contact button with an email thing with a box where you can write whatever you want. If anybody wants to, um, weigh in with any opinions or thoughts on any of these things or others, we're, we're happy to hear everyone's opinion. Um, those are our, those are, that's my uh, Instagram handle and Scott's below. And you know, this, this project for us is a living, breathing, ongoing, um, big, long, complicated project that uh, it's not just the two of us, it's gonna be a lot of people involved. So. So feel free if you're interested in following along on the website or commenting along, we're, we're, we're into it. Now, you know, one of the things you, he just said that interests me, well, I'm one of many, you know, when he, and when Adam spoke about what I'm calling the vessels that will let live on, that becomes a memorial. And we've all watched these memorials have been taken down or defaced in this last year. Uh, specifically after the, the assassination of George Floyd, among others. And, you know, how and where do these memorials live? And if, for example, we can create uh, a meal that honors, say, Matthew Shepard and the, and the pipeline and the little bighorn that are not geographically far apart in real time, in real space, how do we create that conversation and record it? Who is it our job? Because at one point for me, it's about decolonizing and, and taking away hierarchies. It is important possibly, if it can work, for the people who are there to record it and then find out what they reference and what is important to them to share and if they will share it back with us. It is, this is not, it's as daunting as I said earlier but exhilarating and challenging at the same time in all of the good ways. And we'll take an army of like-minded and, and unlike-minded. At some point, I know that I will sit with or cook with somebody who is diametrically opposed to my ideas, but if I can see them and if they can see me and if we can hear each other, maybe we can see where, where we can come together and have certain values. I, appreciated the other day the new um, press secretary at the one of the press conferences when she was pushed against the wall said well is unemployment something that's not important to both parties uh, shouldn't that be having an, a society where everyone is employed or nearly employed be not a political construct and of course she was being rhetorical but we have to look at where is our line in the sand and how can we be a willow tree? How can we be flexible and understand that I can hear you there and maybe I have to rethink how I look at a situation. Sometimes food can be that buffer. As I said to, I have a mentor who's no longer here with us, uh, John Edgerton, one of the 50 founders of the Southern Foodways Alliance. And in his book, uh, Southern Food, one of the things that spurred that book in my mind was the desegregation of the Nashville public school system. And after other schools had already come down, other uh, cities and states. And they did what used to be common in many in communities, sometimes maybe in your own, what we call a covered dish or a potluck supper. And it was at a school and it had church leaders and politicos, city council people, and people involved in local initiatives around Nashville. And when they took the covers off the dishes, black and white people realized they ate some of the same basic foods, whether that was black eyed peas or sweet potato or corn based products. And that allowed them to say, oh, if you eat that food, it, well, how, how do you make it? Or how's your mama make it? So then they had a conversation before they had to get to the, the sticky, difficult thing about, we have to desegregate the school system and talk about ec better racial equity in this town. And, the, and I can't say it will always happen, but it was a, a perfect storm 
where food became the thing that broke down barriers to allow people to see each other. And I, you know, my hope would be that that can happen more often than it doesn't. That's certainly the idea of, of having, you know, one of the questions once I made the decision of um, combining the materials and then making work was what, what to make. And the, the idea uh, obviously of making a plate cup in a bowl was to bring people together around food. That's the, it's an age old proven. I mean, there are, there are meals that are disasters where everyone storms off. And then there are meals where the opposite occurs. And of course our goal is that it, that, you know, we, that people find some common ground around the table that we make. So um, it's a risk uh, and it, I'm sure we're gonna have failures and I'm sure it's gonna be um, a mess and a big daunting thing like the project is, but I guess that's the point, right? That's life, so. Thank you. Thank everybody who came.